All right, so hello everybody. My name is Amalia Weber. I am the program specialist at the Rochester Hills Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's program, Purple Gang, Detroit's own Prohibition Era Criminal Gang. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping details. Firstly, tonight's program will be recorded and available to view about one week from tonight on our YouTube page and on our RHPL website shortly after. For the duration of the program, the audience will remain muted and will remain muted and unable to mute themselves, to unmute themselves, excuse me, and with their cameras off, unable to turn them on in order to reduce distraction during the program. There will be a Q&A after the presentation in which the audience can ask questions via Zoom's chat feature, and I will present them as a moderator for our speaker to answer. I will leave a message in the chat box around the start of the Q&A so everyone will know where to find it. Next, we'd like to thank the friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library and their many fundraising efforts. It's thanks to their support that we can provide wonderful programming like tonight's presentation. Our next program is Preparing the Road Ahead, Water and Infrastructure, presented by the Oakland County Water Re Resource Commission, which will be an in-person event on Tuesday, May 10th at 7 p.m. You can sign up for that at calendar.rhpl.org. And now, without further ado, please welcome our presenter, Joseph Oldenburg. Hello, welcome to everybody. I specifically like to welcome Rhonda and Charles Main. I see Dr. Main's picture there. And uh, the other people in the audience, I do not know you, but welcome. I'm going to now put the program up and the Purple Gang, Detroit's Prohibition era gang of their own. So this is a picture of about 13 men from the Purple Gang. This is during Prohibition. Prohibition lasted from January 1920 to December of 1933. And so that is a total actually of 14 years. Uh, I, when I ask this question, usually if I give this talk, many people will say, I'll say, well, how long do you think prohibition ran? Oh, four or five years. No, it was 14 years total. And during that time, you could not uh, sell or um, make booze or beer in the United States. The Purple Gang was a gang of uh, Jewish young men in their 20s and 30s, mostly in their 20s, actually. Uh, they were responsible for uh, hijacking, bootlegging, we're going to get into all that, rum running, extortion, murder, and they also had a racing wire. And I'll talk about the racing wire in a little more detail in a few minutes. Um, so how many people were in the uh, Purple Gang? Well, when you see uh, uh, figures in, uh, in the written texts, they will say anytime to anywhere between 50 and 100. There's 13 men in this picture right here, and they were all Purple Gang members at the time. This was 1929 when this picture was taken. And the reason it was taken is that they were all arrested in, in, in the, the movie, The Usual Suspects, which was 20 or 30 years ago. This is what happened. So if there was a murder, they would pull in all the Purple Gang guys and talk to them. Of course, none of them would say anything, but they would talk to them. But the, like I said, the, the, when you see it in, in uh, research, you'll see 50 to 100 in the Purple Gang. It was probably closer to 50. And here's 13. So you rep this represents about 25% of the Purple Gang right here. And I'm going to talk in more detail about specific individuals in a few minutes. Um, they were cold-blooded killers. They, they would just uh, frequently in hijacking, if they would uh, hijack a uh, load of booze, they may just kill the, the driver. And they may let them go, but they may, a lot of times they would kill them. They were supposedly responsible for something like 500 murders, and they were only really uh, a prominent gang in Detroit for about 10 or 11 years. And I'll go into more detail in that. Um, they were all relatively short, anywhere from five feet to five feet eight, uh, weighed about 130 pounds or so. That was the, the one of the, the men were, was actually a boxer, uh, had um, nicknames. So there's uh, Abraham Abbey, the agent Zussman, uh, two-gun Harry Altman, one-armed Mike Gelflin. So one-armed Mike Gelflin actually was a man who had lost his arm as a child. And so that was obviously the one arm there. Uh, Isidore Uncle Izzy Kaminsky. 
And the last one I like is Zygmunt Ziggy Fingers, Selvin. Ziggy Fingers was named that because he was drinking in a bar one time and, he, and the man next to him had a wonderful ring. And he said, well, I like your ring. And then he asked, could I have your ring? And the man said, no, you can't have my ring. And they went back and forth and back and forth. And finally, Ziggy got mad. And he pulled out a knife and cut off the finger of the man with the, that had the ring on it. And he took the ring and walked out. And that was it. So, The, the thing that people are interested in usually is the, the, where did the name come from? And there's various possibilities. And the quote that's up at the top there uh, was done probably about 1918, they say. So these boys are tainted, off color. They're yellow, yeah, they're purple. These are two men talking in 1918. That's what they are. They're purple, like bad meat. They're a purple gang. Now that was supposedly to uh, push cart vendors. And push carts were uh, actually, uh, men would buy carts and then they would go down to the, what we know as the Eastern market today. And also there was a market in the center of Detroit, right? Where basically where uh, um, the CompuWare building is today. And they would uh, buy their, their uh, whatever they were gonna sell like fruits or vegetables, et cetera, and then go around the streets. And that's what, and the Purple Gang were part of the group that would steal from these, these push carts. Uh, swimsuits, uh, the story is that when the men of the purple, purple gang would, uh, it would be hot in the summer, they would take the, they would all wear uh, purple swimsuits and go out and uh, swim in uh, Lake St. Clair. Well, the purple, real purple gang didn't have any kind of money like that. They wouldn't have spent money on purple suits, I don't think, purple swimsuits. The purple boxing trunks, a possibility. One of the men that we'll hear about shortly is named, was named Eddie Fletcher. He was a boxer in New York before he came to Detroit. And then he was also a boxer in Detroit. When he was a boxer in Detroit, he wore purple trunks. So is that a possibility of how the, the name uh, occurred, the purple, how they got the purple name? Sammy Purple was actually, his name was uh, Sam Cohen. And uh, somehow he got called Sammy Purple and was at the original uh, for the name. I don't think that's true. And the last was a possibility of a purple sweater. So supposedly the men were sitting around one day and uh, they talked about, well, we should have a name. Gangs have names. And somebody said, well, why don't we, you know, Ziggy over there has a purple uh, uh, sweater on. Let's, how about if we uh, call ourselves the purple gang? I tend to think that the one that's closest is the, the one on the top about the tainted off color. And they're in fact, the best book on the purple gang is called Off Color. And that's about the purple gang. The best book that mentions uh, all the detail about the Purple Gang, plus several names that you will not find really anywhere else. So where did they, where did this gang exist? So this is Hastings Street. Now, where is Hastings Street? Today, picture I-75 and it's going south. And once it gets uh, to I-94 in Detroit, south of I-94 on I-75, that was where the Hast Hastings Street was. It was torn down to make the freeway. So that did, doesn't exist today, but that's where Hastings Street was. And this was called Little Jerusalem. And it was, uh, they would have Jewish, uh, and this is where the, the Jews settled in, that lived in Detroit at the time. So they would, there were delis there, there were grocery stores, there was the sh uh, shoe shops, shoe stores, shoe repair shops. And uh, the Purple Gang, the leaders of the Purple Gang were the Bernstein brothers. I'm gonna talk about them shortly. Their father was a uh, shoemaker and he actually ran a, a shoe shop on, in, on Hastings. And this is 1911. This would have been when the Purple Gang is, they're younger still, but they're still, some of them, some of the early ones, were uh, shoplifting or stealing from those push carts I mentioned. If you want to define uh, Little Jerusalem, it would be Gratiot on the south, Willis on the north, uh, Brush uh, on the uh, Russell on the east, and Brush on the north. Uh, but it is not did not include Eastern Market at this point in time. So what did they look like? Well, this is what they would have looked like. This is not a picture of the Purple Gang itself. There's no pictures of them as uh, young men, but this is what they would have been doing. 
they would have been skipping school and hanging out on the corner and smoking and probably playing uh, uh, gambling games, but uh, also small crimes, extorting money from kids that like their lunch money. And we hear those kind of stories. The Bishop Union School was where they went as uh, um, boys. What happens is the Bishop Union School is basically, it is a, uh, what we would call an alternative high school today. They were problem kids that didn't fit into the regular schools and we would call it an alternative school. It was non-braided um, to the right, which is not shown here at this time. They had actually opened also a trade school next door. So if the if the boys in the Bishop Union School couldn't make it there, they could go and learn a trade next door. And the leaders of the gang, though, were the Bernstein brothers, as I said. After school, they would be playing craps in the yards. So they're gambling already as young men. First one was Abe Bernstein. Abe. Uh, had been born in Russia. So the Bernstein family came to Detroit in 1902. Uh, their father was a shoemaker. And to get off right away and say the Bernstein, the Bernstein, this Bernstein family is not the same as the Bernstein lawyers. They are not the same. They just happen to have uh, the same spelling of the last name. And in fact, uh, in, in specific documents that I have seen, the Bernstein brothers, when they signed things, they signed it B-U-R-N-S-T-I-N. So just to, to, there's a question probably in your mind, are they related to the Bernstein lawyers? And the answer is no. Similar names, but not the same. Um, Abe was the oldest, been born in Russia in 1891, and the family came to the United States in 1902. Uh, when Prohibition started again in 1920, uh, Abe would have been 29 years old. Uh, when, they, when the family came here, he went to the Bishop Union School for a short time. Then he dropped out. By 1910, he's actually working for Ford, building Model Ts in Highland Park. But in 1913, he left Ford and began getting into illegal gambling because it made more money for him, and he was excited by it. So he was the main leader of the Purple Gang. Uh, he was married. Uh, for 10 years and then was divorced, uh, had no children. And we're going to find that's something similar of all the uh, Purple Gang men that, that frequently they were married, but they had no children. Joe Bernstein was his brother. Um, he had also been born in Russia in 1899. So he was uh, 21 as Prohibition began in 1920. Uh, dropout again of the Bishop Union School and learned the, the, the crime, arson, extortion, car theft, uh, pickpocketing, armed robbery, all that from a place called the Oakland Sugar House, which I'm gonna shop and talk about shortly. Um, and he learned about gambling from his brother, his older brother, Abe. Ray Bernstein is the third brother and he was the first one born in the US in 1903. Uh, 17 at Prohibition, dropped out of Bishop Union School as his two older brothers did and was, but was also the, uh, they kind of ran the, a gang, the Bernstein brothers ran a gang at the Bishop Union School, which is called the Bishop's Boys. And uh, they, that gang would evolve over time into the Purple Gang. Their younger brother, the youngest of the Bernsteins is Izzy Isidore. Uh, he was born in the USA in 1906. So he was only 14 when prohibition started. He actually graduated from the Bishop Union School. So he's the only brother that graduated from high school basically, because that's what Bishop Union was, a high school, alternative high school. Um, he gets involved with the, as I said, the Oakland Sugar House and um, so prohibition is, uh, uh, covers 1920 to 1933, like I said, earlier, uh, just to give you some background, uh, before 1873, women were opposed to alcohol because it destroyed the families. The uh, father came home, he was drunk, and they would um, uh, beat up the kids or beat up the wife. And so alcohol, the women were opposed to alcohol. And that's why they started the Women's Christian Temperance Union. That's what the WCTU is in 1873. Um, business favored it. 
and it had strong rural support. Uh, Prohibition all, all, always had strong rural support, uh, whereas the cities where the immigrants came basically from the 1870s into the 1920s uh, moved to the cities and they supported drinking. So especially the German and the Irish groups, they supported, they thought it was good to drink and they, they did not support prohibition. They were opposed to it. The 19th Amendment, uh, excuse me, the 18th Amendment is uh, passed in 1919 and it forbids the importation, sale, and transport of alcohol. But it didn't uh, uh, prevent consumption. So in other words, if you were arrested in a blind pig where you were drinking illegal booze, you were arrested because you were in an illegal, opera, an illegal place, not because you drank the booze. And so prohibition starts January 17th, 1920. And that's when the Purple Gang starts to go into what they were. So the Oakland Sugar House is approximately, approximately right here where the red, red balloon is. So the Oakland Avenue was an, was an area that the Purple Gang, and again, down here is where we're talking about Hastings down here in this area. So where the red balloon is, is where the Oakland Sugar House was. So prohibition forbade the importation or the making of liquor and sale of liquor and beer, but it said that you could make up to 200 gallons of wine a year. But to do that, you had to have sugar. And therefore these sugar houses and the Oakland Sugar House had been around for a while by the time prohibition starts. And uh, so the, the Purple Gang goes in, the, leaves the, basically the, uh, the street um, uh, crime, stealing from the push carts and shoplifting. And they start to work for the, the Oakland Sugar House. It was the training ground for the Young Purple Gang. So they learned armed robbery, hijacking, bootlegging, loan shocking, kidnapping, extortion, and finally murder. And they were known as the Sugar House Gang from about, excuse me, from about 1920 to 1925. And they were, it was a, they, they actually became the most prominent uh, gang in Detroit during prohibition. Number one, was Charlie Leiter. Charlie was the uh, an owner of the purple uh, of the uh, Oakland Sugar House, and he had started that. He had taken over the Sugar House in 1924, and uh, Charlie Leiter. He actually lived through Prohibition, and he was not killed. A lot of the Purple Gang members were not the Bernsteins, but others. We're going to find out, and he ran the Oakland Sugar House along with a man named Henry Shore. And Henry Shore was another uh, person who was the co-owner of the, the Sugar House beginning in, in the mid twenties, they took it over. And he, Leiter and Shore were the ones who trained the Purple Gang in all of those criminal activities. Uh, I'll say now, Henry Shore had a son whose name was Moses and he went by Mickey. And some of those out there my age in the seventies, and I'm in my seventies, um, may, re may recall the um, Mickey Shore that had the audio shops, the car audio shops for years and years. And actually two or three of them are still around, the audio shops. But uh, Mickey Shore, you may have heard of him. This is father, Henry Shore. Eddie Fletcher. Eddie was a, uh, actually originally a New Yorker. Uh, his real name was Samuel Edward Flyshaker. So he wanted to be a boxer. So he uh, took the name Eddie Fletcher and was a boxer in New York. He was only 5'3", weighed 130 pounds. And uh, in uh, New York, uh, up till about 1925, he had a record of 14 and 13. So that's barely uh, breaking even in effect in uh, 14 wins, 13 losses. He came to Detroit in 1925 and um, fought actually here wearing a purple trunk. So is that where the name came from? Well, I don't think so, but that's a possibility that's out there. Um, comes to New York and he is one of the major hitmen for the, um, the Purple Gang. Eddie was said to be a uh, happy-go-lucky, a good talker, nice guy. And his man that he hung out the most with was Abe Axler. Abe Axler was also uh, from New York, um, was 19 as Prohibition started in 1920. 
And uh, he was doing muggings and assaults in New York and things got a little hot for him in 25. So he also came to Detroit and um, he and Eddie Fletcher together were called the Siamese twins. Eddie Fletcher on the left, A. Baxler on the right. These were the best hitmen for the Purple Gang in the 1920s and early 30s. Harry Millman was another uh, hit man, born in Detroit in 1911. So he was only nine when Prohibition started. He got into the gang uh, when he got out of high school. He also graduated from Bishop Union. So he had a, a high school diploma. And uh, when he graduated, he got into the Purple Gang right away. Um, excellent at the protection racket. In other words, going into a, any kind of a shop and saying, all right, you, you need to pay me $25 a week. Uh, and if you don't, uh, major things could happen. And that's the protection racket that was run by the criminal gangs at the time. Um, Hitman for the Purple Gang, big drinker, big fighter. He's a ladies man. Uh, and they always talk about big drinkers. Well, big drinkers, I, I guess I define a big drinker as somebody who would uh, take shots of, of booze directly with no, uh, with no uh, nothing to cut at water or anything else. Uh, Harry Millman drank um, Coke and whiskey. So it wasn't sort of a, a, a big criminal type drink, but that was what he drank. We're gonna hear more about them. So the Purple Gang starts to achieve its, its uh, name, sorry about this picture, but it had blowing up, it lost some of it. In 1925 or so, 27. And what happened was this, at this time in the early twenties, uh, washers in your houses, like we have washers and dryers, uh, was not popular at the time. It still hadn't become the thing that people would buy that sort of thing. And so you took your clothes to a cleaner's if you wanted to change the color, it would be a dyer. So a cleaners would handle both cleaning and dyeing. Now they had uh, cleaners just like we have today, but they all sent their cleaning. They didn't do anything in house like some places do now. They, they send it all to various uh, wholesale operations, which were about six or seven of those. Well, in the mid 1920s, there was a price war uh, between uh, the plants and um, so they decided, the, the plants got together and decided, well, we need some way to you know, kind of control the price because it's just a crazy, it's gonna put, put us out, all out of business. And so they organized and got an actual labor organizer to put together and these uh, cleaners, uh, the companies, not the, the, the workers, but the companies organized this, uh, which would, we would call a, a monopoly today. And um, they appointed a man named Charles Jacob Jacob E. To, to run this thing. And when he, he went back to Chicago and when he left, he left it in the name of a man named Bernstein who was the Bernstein brothers, the Purple Gang's uncle. And so they were hired, the Purple Gang, as the Sugar House Gang, in effect, were, were hired as the, the, the muscle for this. So if somebody didn't want to join, the, their plant would go up in flames or other cleaners would uh, other uh, tailors that provided the business for them would be burned out. Um, as a result of the Cleaners and Dyers War, uh, in 1928, uh, 12 of the Purple Gang were charged with extortion, but they were acquitted. And so they showed that they could get away with this. And this is the beginning, really, of the Purple Gang as, it, as, as we know it today, and their dominance in the area. And actually, 1928 is the first time you see the term purple gang used in the newspapers rather than uh, any other name for this particular group. It's the beginning of their dominance. 1927, this is the Miller Flores apartment. Now, what happened was this. There were three men that came to the uh, purple gang from Chicago. Uh, frequently, the purple gang would accept uh, addition of men that would come in, be sent uh, from Chicago, for, for some reason, Al Capone, who was then in Chicago, uh, uh, head of the, the, bank, the uh, criminal activities in Chicago during Prohibition, basically. And he, something had happened with these particular men and they were basically thrown out of the Al Capone gang and, he, and the Purple Gang said, okay, we'll accept them in Detroit. Well, these three men were, um, they came to the, the uh, Purple Gang, but they were doing um, 
kidnapping and uh, they would kidnap other uh, people from other gangs and hold them for ransom. Well, they kidnapped uh, an affiliate of the uh, couple guys that were an affiliate of the Purple Gang, which they didn't like. And so these three men, we don't need to get into their names, were told uh, the word was put out to them that they could get their one of their own associates, the, the three men's own associates had been um, part of the Purple Gang. And they were told, these three men were said, well, go to the middle of Flores apartment and go to uh, apartment 305 and you'll be able to get your friend back. And so they went there. And this is what happens. It's March, 1927. And the Purple Gang is waiting as these men knock on the door on the right. Four Purples came out of the, um, the emergency exit, the stairway down and the three men were cut down with a Tommy gun. Now, this is the first use of a Tommy gun in Michigan. And the Tommy gun is uh, establishing the, the reputation of the pur Purple Gang as being tough. And if, if you um, went against us, you were going to be killed. And the Tommy gun is this. It's the Thompson submachine gun. And John Thompson, who had been a former general in the army, uh, designed it and built it. It was designed to be used in World War I. By the time they built it and had it literally sitting in crates on docks in New York, ready to go to Europe for World War I, World War I ended in November of 1918. So they were never actually used in the war, but they became famous in the 1920s, especially. So this was built for World War I. It had a 45 caliber shell in it. They had a 20 uh, caliber uh, 20 shell clip and then they had these magazine these drums as they call them right here they could be either 50 or 100 um, bullets in them in the in these magazines and this would weigh with 100 pound with 100 uh, bullets in this one undergrounds as they say would this would weigh 20 pounds your ar-15 which is what we generally use, which is what the army is their uh, basic gun today is weighs only seven pounds to give you an idea of how much this thing weighed. It's said that this thing could literally stop a car dead in its tracks. Just fire a hundred rounds into the, the radiator and, and the engine, it would stop it dead. And so this is how the Purple Gang is going to uh, um, keep its dominance of crime in Detroit during Prohibition. In 1928, this man was an, was an officer. His name was Vivian Welch. At that time, apparently, they used uh, the, the name Vivian, which we tend to think of, uh, at least I do, of a woman's name. Well, it's actually a man's name at that time. And so he had been born probably around 1900, and the, word, the name Vivian could have been used for a man or a woman. He was named Vivian Welch. Well, he comes into, he's a cop beginning in 1923. By 1928, he's become a dirty cop. He's actually being paid by the Purple Gang to, um, to look the other way and not to, not to go into blind pigs. But what happens is Mr. The Officer Welch actually goes in and starts charging blind pigs for protection also. So he's playing it both ways. And the Purple Gang uh, on January 31st, 1928, ran down Welch in, in public during the day, right in daylight and shot him and killed him and then walked away and no one was ever convicted of it. So the fear of the Purple Gang is there. Al Capone, okay. Al Capone actually is born in New York originally um, in 1919, went to Chicago, was sent there by uh, the, uh, the families and the, the crime families in, in New York. And he took over the, um, prohibition operation, uh, the Ill illegal booze and all that in 1925. And in 1928, he actually wanted to, uh, was thinking about going to uh, see if he could take over in, in uh, Detroit. And the Purple Gang met him and said, look, Al, uh, we got the deal is this, you go no further east than I, uh, US 31, which goes between uh, Kalamazoo and um, say Grand Haven up there. And what happens is Al says, yeah, uh, okay, I'll go with that. That's how strong the Purple Gang were. They could keep Al Capone out of Michigan. 
So in 1928, he wants to destroy his competition in Chicago named Bugs Moran. So what does he do? He sets up a deal here in the SMC Cartage. SMC Cartage on Valentine's Day, 1929, which is St. Valentine's birthday. That's why it's called Valentine's Day. February 14th, 1929. And what happens is this, this, this is actually 212 Clark Street in Chicago. And um, what happens is seven men go in there from Bugs Moran's gang. Another Bugs Moran again is the is a, a competitor to Al Capone in Chicago. And these seven men go in there and they've been told to wait for a, 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 a shipment of liquor. And they actually the shipment is coming from the Purple Gang in Detroit because Purple Gang would be able to, to get things across the river. And they provided so much booze to Al Capone. I mean, he was, they were one of his major uh, providers because it was being made in Canada and then uh, smuggled across the Detroit River and then brought to Al Capone's. So they were told, Bugs Moran was told, well, look, uh, the Purple Gang, actually Abe Bernstein, the, the, again, the older brother, the oldest brother and the head of the Purple Gang, said, uh, I called up Bugs Moran and said, okay, we've got a shipment coming and um, where should we deliver? He says, well, SMC Cartage at, uh, on Clark Street. They said, okay. And so seven men were waiting to unload this load of, of uh, illegal booze. Um, the car pulls up and two cops get out, two guys dressed as cops and two guys just uh, in plain clothes and regular clothes. And they go inside. When they get inside, they pull out guns, line up these seven men facing the wall and gun them down with Tommy guns and shotguns. And then they run out and the, so it, then, then they make it look like the two men in civilian clothes are, have handcuffs around the cop. Uh, cops have handcuffs around the civilian clothes men. They get in the car and off they go. So it looks like that the cops had broken up something inside where in fact these men had been basically assassinated. And what, where does the Purple Gang come in this? Across the street from this was, was an apartment building and two of the Purple Gang were there. Two brothers named Phil and Harry Keywell were there and they were the lookouts that told the, that put the call back to Al Capone and said, okay, send your guys because Bugs Moran had gone into the shop. Well, they made a mistake. Bugs Moran never did get into the shop. When he pulled up, he saw the two, the car uh, pulling up with the, the two cops and the plain clothes guys. And he said, something's wrong here. And he didn't go inside, but his seven men were killed in there. And the big thing was, as a result of this, this is what it looked like in there. You're seeing six of the men that are, are right here that were killed. And um, he, uh, Bugs Moran was not killed there, but these these actually seven men total were killed. I, I don't I only see see it six, and that's why I'm I'm saying this. The picture is only showing six at this point in time, and um, so this there was such a public outcry about this that the people in in fact the, the officials in Chicago said, you know what, we got to do something about Al Capone. They never got him on on uh, prohibition violations, but they got him on tax evasion. You've probably heard that. In 1931, he's sent to prison, federal prison for 11 years. He's actually let out, which would have been uh, 1942. He's actually let out in 1939 on a supposed uh, um, medical diagnosis of, of venereal disease. He gets out, he goes to uh, Florida where he had a, uh, a state on Palm Island in 1939, eventually dies there in 1947 of a heart attack uh, after he'd had a stroke, so he was, was not killed by venereal disease, was actually a heart attack. And so that's 1928, February of 1928. In July of 1929, the Siamese twins, Eddie Fletcher and A. Baxler, uh, were convicted of. Uh, violating a, an act called the, the Jones Act. The Jones Act was uh, a uh, additional prohibition act that called for stronger penalties of prison time for um, a uh, violating prohibition act. Initially, the prohibition act had 
gave only six months in prison and say a thousand dollars fine and a thousand dollars then then was a lot of money but in fact it was not a money not a lot of money to the, to the criminal gangs because they had all kinds of money from um, illegal booze sales but Davy Fletcher and A. Baxter were sent to prison in July 1929. So the Purple Gang is getting cut back. They're getting cut. So they're, 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 their zenith is right in 1928. In 1930, Phil Keywell <clears throat> was a Purple Gang member. And, excuse me, I'm, I'm just taking a drink there. The uh, what happened was there was a, a young boy who was only uh, Arthur Mixon, uh, who was an African American boy, and he was uh, sixteen at the time in July of uh, nineteen thirty, and he actually uh, was uh, distributing ice for his dad and going around putting ice in people's uh, refrigerator. They still they didn't have necessarily the automatic refrigerators we have today, so the, the ice box was a place you would get a block, a block of, of isolates by basically 12 by 12. And you actually, the way you could tell how, what, how much ice was gonna be delivered, you'd put a number in your front window. And if you had four, okay, you wanted four blocks of ice. If you had six, you wanted six blocks of ice. And he was doing that in Detroit. And some of his friends were, his friends were following him and they would play baseball in, in while he was doing the deliveries. So one place uh, that he's doing a delivery he uh, pulls up and um, there it's a, a large building and there's a garage door and it's open. It's a, it was a sliding door up and down and it's open. So it's maybe a foot that could be seen. Well, the boys are playing baseball and the ball goes in. Well, Arthur goes in to get it and come gets the ball and comes out and who's standing there, but uh, Phil Keywell, he's a, a Clipper game member. And Keywell says to the kid, so what are you doing? He said, I'm just getting my ball. And he said, and Kimo said, get out of here. And the kid started mouthing off basically. And so Keywell pulls out his gun and kills the, the kid. And he's sent up for life and um, for murder. And that's to be, again, another reason why the Purple Gang is, is its prominence is sliding down. And this is the, the major thing that happens to them. So these three men, um, Joe Leibowitz, uh, Heine Paul, and um, Joe Sutker, these three men were from, again, a group from Chicago that the Purple Gang had taken in because uh, Capone had asked them to do it. And they said, okay, we'll do that. But the problem was that these, the, they called them the terrors because they would kill anything, anybody or anything that got in their way, even just for the smallest thing. Uh, but they were um, counterfeiting and they were hijacking the Purple Gang's booze trucks. And uh, they took over uh, the Irish gang, which was on the, down in the, uh, uh, the old Tiger Stadium area. But they had borrowed money from the Purples and hadn't paid them back. And so uh, Ray Bernstein, again, he's the third brother, but also a leader in the Purple Gang, said, all right, I'll tell you what. Uh, Ray calls a friend of his named Sally Levine, and uh, he says to Sally, who was a bookmaker, Sally was a bookmaker, Sally, who knew the three terrors, and it actually introduced them from Chicago originally to the Purple Gang. Uh, Sally was told by Ray, look, uh, tell these three guys that, all right, we're going to, uh, there's an American Legion convention coming up, um, and uh, we'll let them have some of the money from that, although it's technically the prohibition is still on in 1931. But uh, of course, there's booze behind the scenes at the big American Legion convention, and the terrorists wanted to get some of that money. And Ray said, "Okay, we'll let you have some of that money, and then uh, after uh, the pro the uh, convention's over, we'll talk about what we're going to do then." So everything's clear for that. Just to make sure everything's fine, we're going to discuss this. So you need to go to the Collingwood Hotel on September 16th, 1931. This is the Collingwood. And so the, the three guys that Sally Levine went with the three terrors and they arrived there about three o'clock at uh, room 211 in the Collingwood Hotel. So uh, the Purple Gang, four of them went there and uh, there was uh, Ray Bernstein, Harry Keywell, who was Phil's brother, um, Irving Milberg and Harry Fleischer. So there's four of the Purple Gang there and three of these guys that were from Chicago, plus Sally Levine, the local bookmaker. 
And uh, so they were sitting there having a drink in this room to 11. And um, Ray said, oh, geez, I forgot. I left my cigarettes downstairs. So he goes down into the car and gets into the car and races the engine until he could get it to backfire, which was normal at that time. And when the backfire happened, the three purples still left in the room, got up and started firing their guns. And this is the result. There's a man here, there's a man here, and there's one actually here that you can't see, and just his, his feet basically there. And after they kill these three men, the three purples run over and there's paint cans and they drop paint cans, drop their guns into paint cans because then, then you couldn't pick up the, the fingerprints and off they go with Sally Levine. Sally Levine was not touched at all. So they grabbed him and they took off. They ran downstairs and this is what, so this is the way, the way they are. This one, two, three. Uh, Collingwood called the Collingwood Massacre, illustrated by the Detroit Times, a paper uh, around at that time started in the early 1900s and stopped publishing in 1961. Uh, those again who are maybe in their 70s remember that. So this is the picture of the actual, the, the, a, the outline of the men that were killed. Um, within 48 hours, three of the Purple Gang were caught. We've got Irving Milberg here, uh, Ray Bernstein, and Harry Keywell the, in this order. Um, they were tried, uh, this is in September, and in November they were tried, November the, the 10th, 1931, for murder. And um, one of the, there had been a kid down in the yard who saw Ray jump into the car, and there was a truck driver who identified Ray also as driving the car as it took off. And Sally Levine caved after 24 hours, and he testified against the, the three Purple Gang. One of the Purple Gang escaped, Harry, Harry Fleischer. And so he escaped in this situation. He was, not, he was, later, he was later sent to prison for other things. Um, they were found guilty after a grand total of an hour and 37 minutes uh, by the jury and sent to the max security prison in Marquette. And Sally, Lev Sally Levine, when after that, disappeared in Europe, was later went back to the United States, but it, right after this disappeared in Europe. What happens to the, the, the three purples that go to jail? Well, Irving Milberg is, uh, has life in prison. He went to Marquette and in September of 1938, so seven years after he was in prison, he actually had a, an operation for an intestinal obstruction which went bad, he got peritonitis, and he died in September of 1938. So that was the, the end of what happened to uh, Irving Milberg. And uh, interestingly, when I gave this talk in Livonia recently, uh, a family came up to me and talked to me and they were distant relatives of Irving and said, oh yeah, we, we, the stories we heard from our grandparents about Irving that was, uh, were, were interesting, but he, he died in prison there. Ray Bernstein uh, goes to prison uh, and in the in 1963, he has a stroke. 64, he was uh, compassionately uh, let out of prison and died in 1966. Was never married, never had any kids. And Harry Kewal had the best deal of all. Harry um, actually got life in prison, but his sentence was commuted in October of 1965. Uh, got out of prison, got a job, was married, and finally he dies in Boca Raton, Florida in 1997 at the age of 86, and um, he was the last surviving purple of the Purple Gang. Sally Levine at that, uh, in, the, in the 1970s was living under an assumed name in Kansas City, just to let you know what happened to Sally, and then after that he falls off. Nobody knows what happened to him after that. That's what happened to the men in the, and so what happens is with the 1931 and the uh, Collingwood massacre, the Purple Gang is has internal squabbling, and they start to their their uh, the gang starts to fall apart. What happens to the Siamese twin? Remember them from 19 uh, and uh, the the major hitmen for the for of uh, Purple Gang. 
they come, come home in February of 1933, having spent the winter, as, so they were basically snowbirds. Uh, they spent the winter with their wives in Florida, come home in 1933. These guys are both, both broke, okay? 1933, February, think of this. Think of it, this, in December of 1933, prohibition ends. These guys don't have any money and their job as hitmen is gonna go out the window, especially with the ending of, of uh, prohibition. Um, problem is that they get involved with the East Side Gang, which is what we know as the mafia today from the East Side of Detroit. And um, they get into a restaurant deal with the East Side Gang, it goes sour. They borrow money though, bigger than this. They borrow money from Abe, Act, from Abe Bernstein, leader of the Purple Gang, and they don't pay him back. This is not good. So the day after or the day before Thanksgiving, they are told by uh, one of the guys in the Purple Gang, well, we're going to, uh, we got a meeting. Um, so we'll pick you up uh, about one o'clock in the morning outside a particular bar in Pontiac. So uh, they went to this particular bar, this blind pig in Pontiac. And at 1.15 in the morning, the, uh, the, the twins, pretty drunk at that point, walk out and who comes up but a couple of Purple Gang members. And off they go. And that's the last time they've, they're seen. What happens is within a couple hours by two o'clock uh, in the morning at 16 Mile at Corton and Telegraph Road, there's a new Cadillac sitting there. And it's, that's odd for a, a local policeman. He comes over and he looks inside and there's two men shot and killed in the back seat. And it's the Siamese twins. And whoever killed them uh, actually because they were, again, the Siamese twins always together, always seen as basically one almost. Uh, their hands were, they were holding hands in a sense. And that was probably something that the killer, the, the killers then, the killers were probably Harry Millman and um, Harry Fleischer. Again, Harry Fleischer being one of the men who escaped, the only man who escaped from the uh, Collingwood massacre. So the Siamese twins were killed in 1933. Again, Purple Gang going down. Henry Shore, the man who, again, uh, was the owner of the Oak and Sugar House, has a falling out in 1934 with um, uh, um, Leiter. And in fact, Henry Shore then gets involved in some things opposite of what the Purple Gang want to do. And in December of 1934, he is going out to, he tells his wife, uh, I'm going out to collect money for an older man who doesn't have much, you know, collect some money and then he'll give it to him and, and I'll see you. I'll be back and not too late. And he's never seen again. And it's felt that probably uh, Harry Fleischer was the killer of Henry Shore. And again, Henry Shore is the man who has a son named Moses, who goes by the nickname of Mickey. And he's the Mickey Shore who had the uh, car audio systems, three of which the stores are still around today, as I said. So what happens to the Bernstein brothers, the leaders of the Purple Gang? A. Bernstein, in 1935, this is after Prohibition. After Prohibition, Abe gets involved with gambling, illegal gambling operations down in Miami and in New York. And so he's getting around. Um, Abe also lived he, in the penthouse of the Book Cadillac Hotel the, that had reopened. Well, maybe 10 years ago at this point, he lived in the penthouse from 1939 until 1968 when he died. Uh, that's just an, an aside sort of thing. He gets a call from the East Side Gang in 1935. And they say, come on over, we want to talk to you. And they, and they told him when he went over there in 1935, they said, look, Abe, um, I know there's not much, you don't have much left here, but you do have that racing wire. The racing wire is, uh, if you remember the movie, The Sting, and they had the racing wire where they could get the reports on who won the races before they actually went public in a sense on the radio. And so that then, then they could set up a phony gambling operation and take money from, from people that way. Well, he had that racing wire in Detroit. The Purples had had it for years and years. And Abe was told, look, uh, we, the East Side Gang, are gonna take over the racing wire. Now you either take it or you can and fight or, or fight us on it. And, but if you, don't fight us uh, and take it to and let us just take the, the racing wire. We'll give you a cut. And he would allow, be allowed to have the handbooks. Handbooks were the local betting parlors where men could literally walk in at the back of a store behind a building somewhere. And uh, that's where the, the bookies took the, 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 uh, the bets. 
And Abe would still get a cut of that. And he said, okay, that's fine. So this is really the death knell of the Purple Gang in 1935, because at this point, uh, East Side Gang has taken over the major money-making operation. And anybody that was really left in the Purple Gang actually went and would have worked for the East Side Gang at that point if they were still alive. But one of the last of the Purple Gang, Harry Millman, again, he's the one who, who gets involved in the Purple Gang only in 1930, because he was only um, 19, he'd just gotten out of high school at that point. So the problem with Harry was he, was, he liked to fight. So one day he gets in a feud with the Italian gang or the East Side gang. And there's a man there named uh, Joe Bomarito. And in fall of 1936, fall of 1936, Harry Millman gets in a fight in a, a public bar with Joe Bomarito and beats him up bad. Well, you, you don't show disrespect to a made man. And Joe Bomarito was a made man. And we know what that is. Um, and so what happened was the East Side gang said, he's got to go. And they call Abe and Abe Bernstein. And Bernstein says, OK, I agree. But you can take out Harry Millman. What happens is, first, they try to take him out with a bomb. And this would have been in August of 1937. Uh, the Harry had gone to a, a bar and what happened was they put a bomb in his car. And unfortunately, a doorman named William Holmes went to get Harry's new LaSalle. And the Italian bomb had said, the Italian mob had set a bomb in there and it blew up. Harry was not killed, but he was basically unnoticed. This is, and this, this was the first car bombing in Michigan, actually in Detroit at this point in time. So their attempt to, hit, to take out Harry Millman did not succeed. But in 1937, uh, Harry is um, drinking um, at, a bar, at uh, Boeskies, Boeskies, I always pronounce it Boeskies, um, Deli and uh, Delicatessen, which was on, um, 12th, 12th, I have to get the, the name of the, the other name of the street. And um, he's with Purple Gang members. Two guys come in and open up on Harry. And this is the result. That's Harry Millman down on the ground. He's murdered November 24th, 1937. Uh, the day before Thanksgiving, guess what? The Siamese twins were also murdered day before Thanksgiving, but it was in 1933. So this is a, this is, and actually, this was actually the, the East Side Gang that did this. And they had a couple guys from Murder Incorporated come from New York to do that. So he dies of multiple gunshot wounds. And so the 10, 10 bullets in the, the uh, Detroit News that day with the headline over this, it says, bullets write gangs long overdue obituary. And at this point, He's uh, the, one of the last of the Purple Gang was killed. So what happens to the Bernsteins? Let's cover them a little bit. Um, Abe, uh, as I said, he lives uh, out of life. He lives in the, he's a, a living in the, the penthouse in the book Cadillac from 1939 uh, until his death in 1968. Um, and it was from natural causes. He had invested in legitimate businesses. He was doing gambling. Uh, he spent a lot of time and money to help get Ray out of prison and Ray eventually got out mainly because he had had a stroke. Um, Abe was married at one point for uh, about 10 years and had no kids. Uh, again, and, uh, one of these things where the Purple Gang, again, the, the Bernstein brothers got married, but they didn't, see, they didn't have any kids. And um, he's buried at Bethel um, Cemetery in Livonia. Um, and Joe, the next older brother, Joe Bernstein, this is what it looked like older. He gets involved with casinos and oil wells. Casinos in, in Mexico uh, actually goes down to Miami about 1939, involved with Mexican casinos also, and uh, goes out to California. Um, um, he eventually, he does get married, but he didn't have any kids. And interestingly, he's born, he's buried in a Catholic cemetery. His wife was Catholic. Uh, her name was Marguerite. And uh, she buried him in a Catholic cemetery in El Dorado. 
California. Ray, we've already heard about, but uh, again, he's uh, sent to prison in 1931, um, gets out in 64 and dies in 66 at the age of 63. He never got married, he had any kids. He is buried in Bethel along with Abe. And um, Izzy is uh, involved in crime. This is a 1943 shot of him. He's in Detroit, still involved in different criminal activities. Uh, eventually does, he get, gets married in 1932 actually in Ohio. It seems like when uh, Purple Gang members, not the uh, Bernstein necessarily, but others seem to get married in Ohio for some reason. And I'm wondering if it had to do some with the age of the woman that was they were marrying. But they, he was married in Ohio in the early 30s, died in 1969 uh, at the age of 63, um, and is buried in a Jewish cemetery in Ferndale. So they, in a sense, went back to their, their family, in a sense, took them back to their roots and where they were buried. Is there anything left of what the, the, the Purple Gang was involved with? Well, this is called the Oakland Bathhouse, but it built in the 1930s with some money uh, from a Bernstein. Uh, it was a steam baths and, and pools. And this is it, the original picture of it. It was taken in, um, I would say, maybe in the 60s. And because uh, I'm trying to date the age of that car sitting there. And uh, this was about three blocks from the Oakland Sugar House. And this was would have been south of the Oakland Sugar House on Oakland Avenue. And uh, the Purples would go there. The, the, uh, the East Side Gang would go there too. Sometimes they would have meetings there. And um, so what's happened with it? Well, it's still around. It's called the Shibits now. And you can actually still get a, uh, uh, a steam bath here if you want to. It is uh, technically open uh, by appointment. And uh, a lot of Jewish families have different activities here. Uh, although it doesn't look like much, it is still inside. Quite beautiful from what the pictures I've seen. You can actually go online and look up the Shibits and uh, it will show you uh, this picture and what, what it looks like inside. I didn't bring any pictures because, didn't put any pictures in this talk because I, the talk was going pretty long at this point in time. And that is the story of the Purple Gang. And I'd be glad to answer any questions anybody wants to ask. First of all, thank you, um, that was, it's quite the sordid history, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. All right. We do already have a few questions that were asked okay, during the sure. presentation. So first, yeah. we have who was a likely target for murder by the Purple Gang? Uh, somebody who had crossed them, or uh, meaning uh, either, or somebody who was making the the the, uh, the gang look bad, or attracting too much attention to them, either by the police or by other gangs. And that's why the, uh, some of the other, there was one that I didn't include in there, Izzy, um, uh, Izzy Fingers, the one who, who chopped off the, the finger and took the, uh, the ring. He was killed by the Purple Gang because he was, uh, he was um, getting involved in other things that were taking away from the Purple Gang. And he was, he was getting involved with, the, with uh, cheating the, the East Side Gang. So they came over to the Purples and the Purples said, yeah, he's getting out too far out and we'll take him out too. That would be a, a possibility. And, the, and so a good example is the, the Collingwood Massacre because those three guys were shafting the Purple Gang, still a little no money and didn't pay it. And so we had, to, we had to make an example of them and that's why they did it. They just didn't handle it really well in terms of the Purple Gang itself, because that was the first time they were ever really caught in a specific murder and guys were sent away. All right, next question. Why was Harry Keywell's sentence commuted? Um, I don't have an answer to that, be, uh, except that the Purple Gang, uh, Ray was done at the same time as Harry. And it just seemed, I don't know if it, it was a democratic administration and uh, the uh, governor then was Swainson. And I uh, just felt that it was time. They had served their time. That's the only thing I can think of. There was, as far as I, there's never been any question that anything was taken, that Swainson took anything special, uh, you know, a bribe or anything like that. It was just that they had served 30 plus years because they went in in 31 and now it's in the early or mid sixties. And so they had served enough time. I think that was all. And as, as I said, Harry Keewell was the only one who really 
comes out of this in good shape. All right. Um, did any of the guys from the Purple Gang ever have respectable jobs later in life? Uh, Keywell, as I say, Harry, uh, Harry Keywell and um, Leiter, Charles Leiter. Uh, again, he's, but he ends up just running. He, he owns a bar on the west side of Detroit somewhere. And he's just running the bar 15, 18 hours a day. Uh, the, although Joe and Abe did get involved in uh, Bernstein, they get involved in, in uh, legit businesses, uh, they got most of their money from like uh, Joe with the, with the uh, Mexican casinos and, with, and Abe with the illegal gambling. So not really, they were on, uh, Joe actually ends up being a treasurer of a company in Detroit in about 1935, but he's, he's, the name is just there. He's not really doing anything. And so the answer is really no. Harry is the only one who actually it goes out and, and gets a real job and works. Sure. Is that sort of like you get involved in crime and then you can never really stop? Um, well, part of it, and a lot of them were killed off. I mean, the examples I gave was only part of what really happened to a lot of them too. So they basically, the, the Purple Gang is, is being killed off either by their own or by others. And so I would just say that's, that's the way it happened. Sure. All right, um, next, how many sugar house type businesses existed in the Detroit area during prohibition? Mm, that's a good question. And I don't unfortunately have an answer. There weren't, there were, I, I don't think there were many uh, the sugar house was being the, was the biggest one at the time, but I haven't researched how many others there were. There probably were more around than that. Uh, sugar house, as far as I know, was the biggest one though. But again, you could you could do this two two hundred gallons of your wine at home, and so that was a, a business that the sugar house could be involved in, too. Uh, and but I, I don't have a number. Thanks for thanks for raising that issue, so I can look it up for next time. Um, Chuck Main asks, was it 12th in Philadelphia? Um, possibly. It's very possible. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. Um, Thanks Theodore, for the question, Chuck. <laughs> Theodore asks, did the Purple Gang cause anti-Semitism? No, I don't. The anti-Semitism, unfortunately, was there. That's been there. Uh, one of the things that, that um, rural support uh, are many rural people, and Henry Ford was one of them, uh, came out of a rural uh, upbringing having anti-Semitic feelings. And so that was already there. Um, but 1920 actually is a time when Henry Ford publishes a newspaper that comes out with very anti-Semitic articles. And he was called on it and he, he claimed, well, no, and he sold the paper right after that. But it was still big there. I, I don't think the purple, it, I don't, with the Purple Gang, it wasn't a Jewish issue. Being a Jewish, Jew, being Jewish men was not an issue. It was the crime. That was the major thing that come, from everything I read, that was the major issue here. Not that they were Jewish. Okay. Um, Lindsay says, my grandfather was a railroad engineer and spoke often of being hijacked at gunpoint while they loaded booze on this train. Any knowledge of this? No, but I'm sure it happened. Uh, I don't question that at all. He's lucky that he lived and it wasn't uh, somebody like the three terrors, which would have possibly killed him. Um, but uh, I don't have any particular knowledge of that. By the way, um, as an aside, the term hijacking comes from the 1920s where a man would st step out in the road and slow a truck down, which is go not going 70 like we do today. It'd be going maybe 20 or 30 uh, on the roads they had back then. And, and then the truck would stop and he'd go around to the to the side, to the driver's side, and say hijack, and then say put them up. We're taking your truck, and mm -hmm. so the term hijacking comes from that period. That's where it started. That's fascinating. What a cool piece of information. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've got another question from Sue, uh, who mm -hmm. says, "I had heard the name Purple Gang came from purple dye being thrown into dry cleaners who wouldn't pay protection. Not true." That's true. That's true. That did happen, but the the uh, the, the the die happened. The name I again I don't know. I don't I I would doubt it because they already had the name by then. But purple dye was used because it was it would stain dramatically. Uh, that that they definitely did that. But as far as I know, the name did not come from that. Okay. 
All right, that's all the questions that we have in the chat. I think we should give okay. it just a couple more minutes, see if anybody has anything else to say. Okay. Um, Art asks, how did you get interested in the Purple Gang? Well, I was a, uh, I taught Michigan history at uh, Oakland Community College for about 12 years in uh, the late 90s up till about 2009. And part of it was to talk about uh, Detroit and Michigan in uh, Prohibition era. And I have a separate talk, which I've told Amalia that I, I could give to if they were, in, if you were interested and on Prohibition. And of course, the Purple Gang is the major gang and the major thing in Prohibition in Detroit that's caught people's attention. And so as a result of it, that's how I got interested and just started to research it and felt it was a, it was a talk that people would be interested in. So I was interested because I do my talks generally basic on things I'm interested in. And I felt people would be interested and went ahead with it that way. Wonderful. We've got a few positive comments here. Um, okay. We have a good narration with great supporting photos. Thank you. Um, somebody thanked RHPL and you, Mr. Oldenburg, for this informative session. Um, mm -hmm. Lindsay asks, you mentioned Ohio. One last comment or comment, I guess. Uh, my grandfather's line was Ohio um, into Detroit. Uh, yeah. Um, what happens is um, in, in Michigan actually passes uh, state prohibition that takes effect in May of 1917. Okay. And so from May of 1917 until January of 1920, there is state prohibition in Michigan. It's not that national that yet. It becomes national in January of 1920. So for two and a half years, May 1918, excuse me, until January of 1920, you can't make booze or sell it in, in, in Michigan, but you can do it in Ohio. And so what happened was the 60 mile from Detroit to Toledo was only 60 miles and they would go on a road and go back and forth on that. And that was called the Avenue des Boos. And the road was actually called the Dixie Highway. Um, and it was a road that ran actually all the way from Miami up to Sault Ste. Marie. And uh, basically what I-75 does today. And it was built beginning in 1915, the Dixie Highway was. And so people would uh, uh, actually the Dixie Highway, let me back up a little bit. The Dixie Highway actually was not actually a separate highway. It was actually, they changed the name on a lot of roads and they built some new road, but basically it's a road that existed from Miami up to the Sioux. Uh, but it was just basically, it's a two lane road, nothing like our freeways today back then. Beginning in 1915 as a celebration of the end of the Civil War, the 50 year celebration of the end of the Civil War, 1915, 1865. And so that's what the Dixie Highway was. And it just happened to be the best way to get booze from, from uh, Toledo to Detroit. Uh, people would take their families down there and load up the car, figuring, well, they're never going to stop a car with families in it. That wasn't necessarily the case. It could still be stopped. They, had, they would hollow out bread loaves. Uh, they would ride down in what was called the inner urban, which was a, a, basically an electric trolley that ran down uh, to Toledo, between Detroit and Toledo. And um, so it was a smuggling operation on the Dixie Highway. And in my talk on Prohibition, there's a picture of a car broken down with all the booze standing next to it because the cops have caught, caught this car uh, um, trying to get away. And so that, that was what was going on there with the, uh, the highway between Detroit and Michigan. So her, her grandfather could have easily been uh, a driver on that of just a truck or anything, you know, and very legal in that, but also that's where a lot of booze is coming into Michigan between uh, May of uh, 1917 and uh, January of 1920. Okay. Um, Lawrence says, any comments on the Purple Gang's connection with Graceland in Lupton, Michigan? Yeah, uh, that, that was a, uh, I didn't include it in this, but uh, that was a place that was actually built by one of the Purple Gang, the Mike Gelflin, Gelflin the, um, yeah, Graceland Ballroom in Lupton. Yeah, Mike Elfin, who was the one-armed man, he uh, was lent, lent uh, $40,000 by Joe Bernstein, uh, by Abe Bernstein to, to build that. And it was in Lupton, Michigan. Um, 
and the uh, the purples would hang out there. Uh, Compo uh, Al Capone also visited occasionally. They would have meetings there. It's about 75 miles north of Saginaw and what is Lepton. It burned down in 1981. Otherwise, I would have uh, shown you a picture of it. Um, but yeah, Lepton, they were definitely connected to the uh, Mike, Mike Elfin, the one-armed Mike, uh, built that and with money from Abe Bernstein. Yes, you're very right. Not many people know that. Um, let's see. Uh, quite a few people are thanking you, uh, saying oh. that you have a very interesting presentation. Um, and uh, Chuck wanted to clarify, it was 12th and Hazelwood. 12th and Hazelwood, he found it. Good. Okay, Chuck, thank you. Say hi to Rhonda. Um, okay, another question from Theodore. Uh, mm -hmm. was, the, was the Purple Gang involved with gambling in Toledo? Not that I know of, but Joe um, would have done that probably on the side for himself. Uh, and it, it, he would have known the gambling, the local gambling operation. So possibly Joe Bernstein was involved with that, but I, not for the gang, for himself only, I would think. I'm sorry, Abe Bernstein would have done that. It doesn't look like we have any more questions. Um, do you have okay. any final any final comments before we close out for this evening? Nope. All right, then I think we'll go ahead and call it here. Um, thank you everybody for coming and thank you, Mr. Oldenburg for presenting um, all the information that you've brought for us today. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right, have a good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>